Hi, I'm Rachel Sennis with City TV, and welcome to Inside Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara's only news magazine show. We bring you up to date on the city's latest projects, issues, and events. Today we are coming to you from our very own City TV production studios. A lot of you may wonder what it takes to put a show together. You may often spot our camera crews out in the field shooting video and interviews. The other part is post-production, which happens right here. This is where our producers sit and edit stories. We cover everything from significant issues of the City Council to emergency preparedness, or like this month, affordable housing. In our top story, we go inside the city's most recent housing complex for income-qualified downtown employees. People's Self-Help Housing has just put the finishing touches on this long-anticipated project. We took a sneak peek, and as you're about to see, its new residents are excited to call it Home Sweet Home. They say when one door closes, another one opens. This is especially true for 12 low-income downtown employees whose new address is 21 East Annapamu Street. People's Self-Help Housing is rolling out the welcome mat for this group of people who get to call Casas Las Granadas home. One of the lucky dozen is Elizabeth Middleton. For the past two years, Middleton has been living in this small studio in the Victoria Hotel, an affordable housing complex next to the Granada Garage. So many things to try to pack here. But she is ringing in the new year with a new place to live, on the other side of the Granada Garage. Middleton has been retired for a few years, but maintains a job as a musician. And hearing the news that she has been chosen to live in the new affordable housing complex was like music to her ears. It feels like a whole new beginning. <laughs> it just feels like it just feels like I'm ready to move on. Ready to move on and move in to this building, a redevelopment agency site. The project was made possible by three major funding sources. Uh, one being federal home funds, and these are funds that the city receives from the federal government for the sole purpose of building affordable housing for low-income people. So that had to be a consideration here. Um, we also got federal low-income housing tax credits, and those also have to go to low-income people. And the third piece of financing was the redevelopment agency. And the redevelopment agency is basically providing free land to this project. We issued a request for proposals for this site to build affordable housing. And we invited a number of developers to respond to the RFP and submit their proposals for what they would like to do on the site. And as a result of that, we selected People's Self-Help from that competitive process. The mission of People's Self-Help Housing is to provide affordable housing and programs for low-income families, seniors, and other special needs groups on the Central Coast. Since its creation in 1970, more than 1,200 rental units and 1,000 homes have been developed. People's Self-Help passed out about 75 applications for these affordable units in Casas Las Granadas. Applicants must fit this criteria. They must be low income, work in the downtown core, and do not own a car. Although the area is only about 4,600 square feet, the city's planning commission granted the affordable housing project some modifications, like density bonus and no parking. Well, density bonus is a situation where we are allowing developers to build to a greater density as long as they include affordable housing. And with easy access to jobs, retail shops, bus lines, and a bike station next door, tenants are expected to get around well without cars. At Casa de los Fuentes, there was a limitation on automobile ownership, one automobile per unit. We were able to then build to a greater density, and we were able to build with, with fewer parking spaces as a result of those restrictions. Um, that's worked very well there. In fact, even though we have very few spaces there, they haven't even parked up to half the capacity of the parking that was provided there. The Housing Authority allows people who don't have automobiles to go to the head of the waiting list. So there's a preference for those people in the, um, in the selection of tenants for the project. I think a similar thing will happen here, that we won't have people with cars. Well, we're on the top floor of Casa Las Granadas. 
Uh, we're in a one-bedroom unit that overlooks the uh, library and all the green space on Anapamu. You can look. We have a big pantry, great big bedroom, nice kitchen, living area. Beautiful, beautiful apartment. And from their balconies, residents will be able to look out to the front of their building, where there are plans to install a landscaped area for the public to enjoy. We already have a large amount of foot traffic in the area, and this is more of just providing an amenity for people who are already in the downtown area. A place to have lunch, a place to take a break, somewhere where you can sit for just a little bit and then, you know, get on with the rest of your day. The entire sidewalk along this area all the way to the corner will be replaced and new. And then also uh, four new street trees, three or four new street trees are going to be going in along the sidewalk. And that will really add a lot more shade to the area, just make it a much more pleasant place to, to walk along. Although there are nice views and spacious rooms here at Casas Las Granadas, People's Self-Help Housing says it provides more than just a place to live. As residents settle inside their new home, People's Self-Help hopes that their lives outside these walls may start to change for the better. When the organization first took off, it realized that simply providing roofs over people's heads was not enough. We really want to focus on providing services to our residents that will help them in the future, both their children and the adults. What we've seen, uh, especially with single moms, is after they get an affordable housing situation and we provide education services for their children, suddenly the moms have much more self-esteem. They're able to get a job paying more money. We, we see a trend with all our families that over time their incomes go up. And we think that's first they get an affordable roof over their heads, but then more than that, we open doors for them to other things in the community to help improve their lives. People Self Help has a history of hiring people who live in our housing. And so many of the farm workers that have lived in our units, we found out are the best landscapers in the world. We've hired a lot of the women to then start working in property management. So we see it as providing economic self-sufficiency. People's Self-Help is a group that new tenant Elizabeth Middleton doesn't take for granted. There is hope. There is hope. There are options. And there is new hope for tenants of Casas Las Granadas like Middleton, who are moving in and starting 2008 on a high note. The Redevelopment Agency and People's Self-Help Housing worked with surrounding businesses to minimize impacts during construction. For more information on People's Self-Help Housing, go to our website, citytv18.com. Well, here at City TV, we do more than just put this show together. We also broadcast live meetings like City Council and the Architectural Board of Review. And it all happens here. Right now, we are airing the Planning Commission. City TV Studios is located inside City Hall in the heart of downtown. And as downtown employees, we experience the convenience of being able to walk to shops, restaurants, and other businesses. Many of us here at City TV walk or bike to work. In our next story, City TV's Dominique Blocker shows us how recent improvements to Chapala Street are giving downtown pedestrians more reasons to enjoy walking. On any given day on Lower State Street, heels outnumber wheels. Just one block over, Chapala Street is more of a vehicle thoroughfare, and it has long been the major artery for the flow of goods to businesses west of State Street. But recently, mixed-use buildings, or structures that house both businesses and residences, have begun to rise along Lower Chapala, increasing the number of pedestrians. We saw that the street was going to become more of a pedestrian-oriented street than it had been previously. And the Paseo Chapala and the Chapala Lofts are great examples of what we saw coming, where there was mixed-use development and uh, residential properties overhead so that we would expect more pedestrian activity. Because of this increased development on Chapala Street, in 2004, the City Council adopted the Chapala Street Design Guidelines to direct new construction and street improvements from Highway 101 to Carrillo Street. Their goals are to increase safety, functionality, and the visual appeal of the street, all while encouraging pedestrian traffic. 
We looked to the streetscape to see how we could improve the sidewalks and the planter strips and the access ramps to really encourage and invite pedestrian activity. We spent a lot of time working with the city uh, and landmarks architectural review uh, to really uh, have it thematically look like it's been part of Santa Barbara for a long time. So in keeping with that, you'd also like to finish it off nicely on the exterior and have the streetscape blend in with the actual architecture of the building as well. So yeah, it's a big benefit for everyone, I think. Chapala Street is very important for its delivery function as well as its pedestrian function. So in looking at the design of the whole corridor, we had to make sure that we could still accommodate large trucks and access into the parking structures, for example. What we could do with the Chapala Design Guidelines is look at a unique paving material for the street, look at uh, enhancing the planter strip, looking at providing directional ramps. Another benefit of the new ball bouts is that since crossing distance is less for pedestrians, the time that cars have to wait at the traffic signal is also less. Now, when a project goes through the planning process, the city looks for opportunities to partner with the developers to expand pedestrian improvements. It was clear that the whole intersection needed to be treated. So in partnership with the redevelopment agency, we were able to do both corners at the same time. The city was actually the, the agency that did the construction for both in partnership with the Paseo Chapala development. Everybody wants to make a good project, and everybody wants to help bring it across. And I think the teamwork and collaboration that takes place is very commendable to the city. We're happy to work with them, and I think the city should be proud of the people that work for them. With the Chapala Street improvements, the wheels of trucks and vehicles continue to roll to downtown businesses. The only difference now is that they will be accompanied by more of those that choose to walk. For more information on the Chapala Street improvements, visit SantaBarbaraCA.gov. Well, Santa Barbara has one of the greatest park systems in the country. The city puts a tremendous amount of work into keeping our parks beautiful, but as you're about to see, the city just received an award for what it doesn't put into them. Alice Keck Park Memorial Gardens is the perfect setting for a brisk walk, a family photo, or even a wedding ceremony. It's a green park, meaning it is managed with the least toxic materials possible. This is a sustainable park. We do a lot of mulching, so that controls weeds. We use another chemical called uh, warm gold, which is warm castings. And uh, we had a major problem with giant whitefly and with using this uh, warm gold castings, we uh, ended up uh, eliminating the uh, giant whitefly. And visitors to the park may catch crews turning up the heat. Literally, parks crews use this weed flamer as a non-toxic way to burn and kill immature weeds. This is aquaside, which uses steam to kill unwanted grass on blacktop or around trees. These are only a few examples of how the city is committed to reducing the use of toxic materials in city parks. It's called Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. In January 2004, the city adopted IPM as a strategy to reduce the use of toxic materials in parks. The backbone of the city's IPM program is the FAIR zone model. The FAIR model assigns green, yellow, or red zones to sites or portions of sites based on the potential for humans or habitat to be exposed to hazardous pesticides. Each colored zone determines the kinds of materials that are used to manage the parks. Green zones are areas of high exposure potential. Only pesticides designated as green, which show very limited human and environmental impacts, may be used. Under the FAIR zone, the Parks and Recreation Division has determined that 98% of city parklands can be managed green. Some of the city's green parks include Shoreline Park and East and West Alameda Parks. Yellow zones are areas with less potential of harm from exposure. Franceschi Park is considered yellow. Mackenzie Park is yellow as well, but with additional funding allocated by City Council, it will become green this year. As for the red zones... It's considered special circumstances, and red materials, 
The majority of those are fungicides. The largest area of red zone areas are at the golf course, and they're on the golf course greens. Trying to go grow turf on golf greens is very, very difficult. To maintain such heavily used land with so little pesticides is no walk in the park. But the city's proactive approach to integrated pest management has paid off. The IPM program has taken state honors by winning the Innovator Award from the Department of Pesticide in Sacramento. It's an honor because uh, it's an award that doesn't come, come easy. And within our innovations, not only is the innovations with our fair zone, but all the techniques that the City of Santa Barbara Parks and Recreation Department has implemented in order to, to keep plugging away towards our, our green sustainability model that we have, we're so proud of. It's a labor of love and you can tell by uh, walking our parks and seeing our, our employees, staff working diligently on a day-to-day -day basis, just keeping our 105-year parks history legacy going. The city will receive the IPM Innovator Award in mid-January. So the next time you walk your dog or take your kids to one of the city's many parks, remember that parks crews manage them with a lot of TLC and a lot less toxic chemicals. Parks like Alice Keck Park Memorial Gardens, the Mission Rose Garden, Franceschi and Chase Palm Park need special attention, so an extra hand is always welcome. Volunteers are needed on an ongoing basis to help crews manage them. So if you love the outdoors and appreciate city parks, you can join these crews by helping maintain parks like gardening, weeding, or rose pruning. A chance for you to be a part of the award-winning Integrated Pest Management Program and an opportunity to learn the ABCs of IPM. If you're interested in volunteering to maintain the beauty of city parks, call 564-5480. Well, here at City TV, we have several student interns who help out with production. Our most recent intern is Darren here, who we hired from the Youth Apprenticeship Program. We first brought you that story in a recent episode. The city's Youth Apprenticeship Program matches local teens with work within city departments. In our next story, we continue our focus on youth and explore how, by having a job, a young person gets more than just a paycheck. The greatest truth must be recognition that in every man, in every child, is the potential for greatness. This quote by Robert Kennedy speaks to something that many youth programs in Santa Barbara take to heart. Local youth need a chance. They need an opportunity. These programs are working to give kids not only opportunities today, but also the experience that can lead to greater opportunities tomorrow. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi um, do you mind if I check your permits, please? Many local programs are focusing on the need for jobs for Santa Barbara's youth. Youth jobs not only provide financial benefits to the young workers, but also give them a safe place to be. One proponent of youth jobs is Santa Barbara Chief of Police, Cam Sanchez. And whether it's from the parents of children in the Police Activities League, or those of the kids the police have arrested, he says he hears the same thing. More jobs for young people, uh, mentoring programs, um, you know, internships, all those sorts of things. So when we talk about that, I think it's, it's critical to, to really look at a two-pronged approach. Encourage them to stay in school and to, to get some work where they can learn you know, a variety of life skills that they really need. The Youth Apprenticeship Program is working to help youth gain those skills. A city program that helps match local youth with jobs in different city departments, it is helping Santa Barbara teens with each step of the job process. They actually helped me through all the process, all the paperwork and everything, so I didn't have to stress over it. At first, they showed me how to put books away, children's and adult area, and now I get to check out books, check in out, check out books. I learned how to turn off a computer just using the keyboard. And the skills learned from the Youth Apprenticeship Program are not only applicable to their specific jobs. I get to learn how to be more patient and kind of to deal more with people. Like if people kind of get a little bit out of control, you learn like to talk more calmer to them and to understand them in a better way. And communication skills too. 
you have to communicate a lot in this job. But the youth apprenticeship program is not the only way the city employs youth. It also works with other youth programs. Recently, the Creeks Division hired youth cinemedia to produce educational videos. This piece was put together by the program's youth, who were able to learn valuable job skills and earn a paycheck. What we do is we work with teens uh, ages 13 to 19, and we teach them the basics of video production, music production, and multimedia art. It's been really exciting to be able to give them those opportunities, so to, to say that you know the city of Santa Barbara is paying you to do creek-based video pro projects, photography, graphic design. We've done ads. We've done a variety of different things for them. So the response has been very positive. The program's youth are getting on-the-job experience and learning about Santa Barbara's environment. They are also being introduced to tools and training that can help them find future employment. What that's done is allow them to see technology in a whole new way, that it's not just a gadget that I can you know, send an email or uh, download a song or for just entertainment purposes, but that it becomes a, a tool to help them develop their thoughts. The city is also acting to give youth a greater voice in government. This past fall, the Parks and Recreation Commission, the Plan Santa Barbara Commission, and the City Council Commission on Youth and Children each appointed a new youth intern. I think it's huge, a huge step for them to be inviting the feedback from people who are younger than them, um, especially in the high schools right now with all the gang violence. Um, this is a key time and transition time in Santa Barbara where people are looking and asking questions like what's going to happen next, what can we do to help kids, and if you're not getting the feedback from people who are involved in it every day, they're a little disconnected. If we're trying to create a community that is going to be prepared for the future, and since the youth are the future, um, of this town, then I hope that they, you know, it is crucial that they incorporate youth opinion and youth voice and that it's from a, a broad spectrum of youth. And this variety of input doesn't only help local youth. I think the whole city will be helped if we begin to, to, to do that type of an outreach, or I like to call it in-reach. So it's critical. I think it's critical. A critical step that Santa Barbara is taking. And the efforts of local youth programs aren't going unnoticed. The city's teen programs were recently honored by the Southern California Teen Coalition. Their work with the Youth Council City Council Candidate Forum, ADAP Social Host Ordinance, and the recently opened 1235 Teen Center all help to distinguish them among other Southern California teen programs. Before I ended freshman year, I was like, I need to get a job this summer because I'm tired of just doing nothing. Because like before, I always used to do community service things with kids. So I was just like, I need to get a job. I got a job, and I was happy. I think I've grown a lot. I've learned about um, city government and how it works and the functions of it. But it's also given me um, a sense of confidence and a sense of, I guess to say, self-respect that I that I'm able to, to be on such, or to have such an honor to be on a commission and that they would um, take my opinions into consideration. I think it's like a great experience and it's a great way for young people to learn how a real job works. It's actually my first official job, so um, I, I actually really like working for the city. This year alone, the Youth Apprenticeship Program has helped over 50 local youth get jobs in Santa Barbara. For more information on this program and other youth services, call 882-1235. Well, here at City TV and the rest of City Hall, we engage in sustainable practices like composting and recycling. In our next story, Van 2 explains how a large corporation has a New Year's resolution to be green. Banks have long had an interest in green, but one local bank is now investing in a different kind of green. For customers at Santa Barbara Bank & Trust, it's business as usual. But behind the scenes, things are definitely changing. You're in the inner sanctum of Santa Barbara Bank & Trust right now. Recyclables, cans, bottles, papers right here. Anything that's not really important goes right in here. 
Going Green is the bank's New Year's resolution, and they're teaming up with the city's Recycle at Work program, headed by Environmental Services. What we're hoping from the Santa Barbara Bank and Trust and City Partnership is to show that it's actually um, very doable and easy and convenient and can save money. We all need to be very mindful of all the environment, environmental impact that we leave uh, on our communities. We want to make sure we send a very important message to the people that come in and see us that we're very much a part of the community. We give the free bins um, in a variety of sizes so it's really tailored to fit each business's needs. When you look at the numbers, increasing recycling and reducing trash adds up. With business trash services, two 32-gallon cans cost $38.14 per month. By recycling, businesses can get up to three 32-gallon cans or one 95-gallon can picked up free every week. By not recycling, businesses are literally throwing away money along with valuable resources. I think to varying degrees most businesses do something, but we finally just said we want an orchestrated game plan to put it all together to see that we're doing all the right things. Doing the right things when it comes to recycling isn't easy for some, like coffee cups. The best option is to use a reusable cup like this one. Still, many people opt for these. Since these cups are lined with plastic, they are not recyclable. The Environmental Services Department says that these cups are the item most found in recycling bins that don't belong. However, the lid is good to go. The biggest misconception we deal with in Santa Barbara is that our trash is sorted. It's not sorted at all. If you throw something in the trash can, if you throw that soda can in the trash can, it's going to the landfill. Also, a lot of people think that um, paper is the extent of recycling and here we have you know mixed recycling which is really great you can throw in your paper your plastic your metal and your glass all together as long as it's clean and that is makes it extremely easy for businesses to recycle and people are always shocked that so much of their trash is recyclable what we tell people a lot is it's better to be safe than sorry if you're not sure about something whether or not it's recyclable we typically tell people to throw in the recycling containers and we'll let the recycling center decide that for themselves we're not experts in this area. We're relying on people who know what they're really doing. And I'm looking for the city to guide us as we go forward and going green. The Recycle at Work program is available to all businesses in the city. Santa Barbara Bank and Trust is the largest company yet to take it on. It really um, says a lot about what Santa Barbarans want to do for recycling and for the community. And it's one of our largest corporations locally, so it's a big, big deal. Actually, I hope it will affect um, much more than just the Recycle at Work program. I hope that it affects the entire business community in Santa Barbara. About 15 percent of the material collected from those entities is actually being recycled right now from the commercial sector. In the residential sector, uh, it's closer to 50 percent. With those statistics in mind, we see there's a lot of room for improvement from, from commercial entities in Santa Barbara. By getting more businesses to recycle, a substantial amount of waste can be diverted from the landfill and will bring Santa Barbara closer to some ambitious goals. The latest goal that's been touted by the mayor is 85% diversion by 2020. This is a huge step in the right direction. And what I hear about this new program, it looks like we're going to be expanding our efforts and so I'm really proud of my employer, really. We do have the best employees. They do want to do the right things for the bank, for the community, for the environment, and for themselves. So it's a great team, and we're looking to make good things happen in 2008. For more information on how your business can go green, go to sbrecycles.com. Well, that does it for this month's episode of Inside Santa Barbara and our tour of City TV. Next time, we'll take you somewhere new and keep you up to date on the city's latest issues, projects, and events. You can also watch us online at CityTV18.com. If you have any questions or comments about our show, give us a call at City TV at 564-5311. I'm your host, Rachel Asenis, and remember to get involved inside Santa Barbara.